Welcome to the Western Standards, uh, the pipeline, our weekly Wednesday current affairs program. I'm Western Standard publisher Derek Fildebrandt. Joining me today is Western Standard news editor Dave Naylor. How you doing, Dave? I'm a little bit tired uh, after last night, but uh, it was good fun. Indeed. And Corey Morgan, podcast editor and columnist with the Western Standard. Good day, Corey. Good day. All right. Well, uh, last night was absolutely fascinating. Uh, our broadcast ran out of time. Uh, Facebook li uh, Live limits us to eight hours. And uh, frankly, I can't say I'm sad we ran out of time. Uh, I was happy to go to bed. Uh, we finished our broadcast around 1230 last night. We ended it with a prediction, uh, a prediction that uh, Donald Trump would carry the evening. Uh, that prediction was not a solid one, but uh, one we felt reasonably comfortable about. I think overnight and into the morning, things have become a bit uh, less sure. But uh, let's go to you, Dave. Uh, give us a rundown on where things stand right now after uh, developments uh, early this morning. Well, I'm uh, sure a lot of people are feeling tired today because uh, it was a very, very long night. The voting in the states is now coming down to six states and probably thousands of uh, lawyers. Uh, let me just call up the uh, the latest uh, stats here. We've got uh, Arizona, sorry, uh, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, all still not declared winners. Trump is leading in three of them. Biden is leading in three of them. Biden's leads are a lot narrower than Trump's leads are. And I'll just quickly give you the figures and then you guys can discuss uh, uh, which pathway is going to go where. In Georgia, 95% of the vote has been counted. Uh, Trump leads 50.2% to 48.5%. That seems to be a comfortable lead in Georgia. In North Carolina, 94% of the votes are counted, and it's Trump with 50.1%, Biden 48.7%. Pennsylvania and its uh, 20 electoral votes, only 64% of votes counted, and it's 53.4% for Trump, 45.4% for Biden. The three that are in Biden's favor at the moment include Michigan, very, very close there. 96% of all ballots have been counted. Joe Biden in the lead with 49.7. Donald Trump trailing by less than a percentage point at 48.9. In Wisconsin, 95% of the vote has been counted. Joe Biden is ahead 49.6% to Trump's 48.9%. Uh, Trump has already said his campaign will be demanding a recount in Wisconsin. And finally, Nevada, 67% of ballots counted. I guess they were up late last night on the slot machines. Uh, very, very close race. 49.2% for Biden, 48.6% for Trump. So, gentlemen, this race still could go either way. Uh, absolutely. It's uh, Last night it looked like Trump was on a clear path, uh, however narrow a path that is. looked like he was on a clear path to victory with leads in Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, those two leads have evaporated. Biden now has narrow leads, as uh, you've said, Dave. Um, the current math. Uh, now we'll actually we'll pull up the, the um, we'll we'll actually pull up the, uh, the map here again. Uh, you'll see here there are only two states in in America that uh, do not that are not necessarily winner take all states. Uh, that's Maine in the upper uh, northeast there and Nebraska, right, in the center of the country. Um, Maine's a blue state, Nebraska's a red state, but there is an opportunity for uh, a single electoral vote to be cast to the other party if they can win a certain electoral district. Uh, Trump has won Maine, picking up one point, and Biden has won uh, 
one of those points in uh, Nebraska. Now, if Trump had held all of Nebraska, even though he won it by 20 points, a very sizable lead, Biden managed to win a single electoral district. Uh, if that had not happened, they would both be tied at 69 electoral college votes, which would have each of them one vote shy of a majority of the electoral college. Uh, that would be a tie. And then it would go to the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, which, because they vote on a state-by-state -state delegation basis, not as individuals, would likely favor Trump in a bizarre tie vote scenario. Uh, that's unlikely to happen because Nebraska is going to keep its vote for Biden. Under the current math, uh, if all current leads hold, Biden wins by an absolute nail biter of uh, 270 electoral college votes, and 270 is exactly what you need to win. I can't imagine, I'm not aware of any uh, presidential election that's been won with the exact number of electoral college votes. It'd be the absolute slimmest of possible margins uh, to be decided uh, in an election outside of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, Corey, uh, give us your breakdown on how you think uh, things are going to progress here. Uh, really, it all hinges on Trump flipping one, uh, holding all of his leads, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia. Uh, give us your thoughts. On, he's now got to flip either Wisconsin, Michigan, or Nevada. Uh, give us your thoughts on what do you think the chances of that happening are, or you think uh, Biden is going to be able to hold it and uh, get in by uh, the slimmest of margins here? Yeah, I, I don't think it's looking very good for President Trump. Uh, the only one that's kind of race that's narrowing in his favor has been Nevada. That started actually with a strong Democrat lead. And as the votes have been coming in, it's actually narrowed and come closer for Trump. But really key was, was Wisconsin and, and uh, Michigan, which again last night looked uh, nice and locked for him. And now they're very much in question. And, and what you got to look at is, is the trending as the votes come in, which way are the leads changing? And in those ones, it, the more votes that come in, the, the worse he's, he's looking. Uh, people talked about that earlier. I mean, Trump really dominated at first because he the voters who came out on Election Day tended to be Republicans. Those are the ones that came in, cast their ballot in person. Uh, the Democrats really campaigned on the fear of the plague and telling everybody, send in your mail-in ballots. You must do mail-in ballots. And now we're seeing that. Those take longer to count. They're coming in, and they definitely are being dominated by Democrat votes. Uh, as well, you're really seeing a rural-urban split. You know, you're, you're seeing in these states, the, the, this, the high population centers are tending to lean Democrat, and, and the rural areas are, are strongly Republican. Uh, but it's often the cities that are the latest in their counting because they got those larger districts and larger amounts of votes. So same thing as those votes keep coming in and trending when you're getting votes out of Detroit, you're getting votes out of Green Bay, areas like that. Again, it's not doing Trump any favors in, in picking these up. So uh, personally, as, as the trend said, I mean, he might still hang on to uh, uh, South Carolina, Georgia or North Carolina and Georgia, but he's really got to, I think, get uh, Wisconsin or Michigan, and, and those are looking really tight. Pennsylvania, he's got, a, I, I believe that lead's going to narrow by quite a bit, but he's holding a pretty good one. He might hang on to that, and that's pretty key as well, of course. Gentlemen, I've got some uh, breaking news. Uh, CNN has just declared Biden a winner in Wisconsin. So that's, uh, that's what oh. I'm being told, and uh, only CNN is reporting that at the moment as far as as I can see, but uh, well, from what I'm sorry, well, from what I'm seeing, it's 95% of the vote in, um, and Biden has a very slim lead. Uh, it's 49.6% Biden to 48.9% Trump. Uh, the, he uh, Biden might well take that by the slimmest of margins, uh, but 5% coming in, I'm not sure you can call that yet, unless CNN has earlier results than we have. Yeah, I've got the same figures as you, Derek, and uh, the figures we've got, it's too early to call, but uh, CNN has seen something that they like and have given it to uh, to Biden. Very interesting. Well, let's go through the math here about the different scenarios. So let's, uh, let's say Biden takes Wisconsin. Um, we can, uh, we'll give him that. Um, let's give him Wisconsin. Um, Right now, Biden sits at 270 if he holds that. Trump needs to flip 
any one of the remaining. He has to hold Georgia. If he doesn't hold Georgia, he's done. If he doesn't hold North Carolina, he's done. If he doesn't hold Pennsylvania, he's done. And then he's got to flip something else. He's got to flip. If he flips Michigan, he wins. If he uh, flips uh, Nevada, he wins. Uh, slim, a very slim margin if, if he takes Nevada. But Trump has to hold everything that he's leading in currently and flip one other. Uh, and Pennsylvania, there's still a lot of votes to come. Uh, it's not guaranteed he holds it. He's got a He's got about a seven-point lead in Pennsylvania right now, but there is only 64% uh, of the polls reporting. There is a lot of room to maneuver there. Uh, and North Carolina, he'll probably carry it, but it's tight. Georgia, he'll probably carry it, but it's tight. Um, but he's definitely got to hold Pennsylvania and switch any other one of those states that are currently leaning blue to his column. If you can Derek, do it, you win. Sorry, Derek, a little bit more breaking news for you. Uh, the Trump campaign has sued the state of Michigan. It's just coming in now. They're demanding that the counting be stopped. They want greater access to uh, scrutineers at polling and counting sites. Uh, so that is now before the courts. And uh, ironically, at the same time, Biden has launched a fundraising campaign to pay his legal bills. Uh, obviously, it's... Uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of richer lawyers in the United States uh, at the end of uh, a couple of weeks. But uh, those two little pieces of breaking news. Yeah, right now it looks like the only real winner are the lawyers. Uh, there's an absolute army of lawyers found out across the swing states right now. Nevada, one reason we have so little out of Nevada right now and had so little last night is that uh, polls, uh, Trump, the Trump campaign sued the state to uh, keep polls open, I think, for another hour after they were supposed to close. Um, they claim there were irregularities stopping many of uh, their supporters from getting to the polls and voting. Um, remember, Nevada went, uh, voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 by the narrowest of margins. Uh, very, very narrow. Uh, the difference was actually made up by uh, Libertarian third party candidate Gary Johnson. The Libertarians are not as strong this year. They have a much lower profile candidate, so they're not making as much of an impact. Um, so Trump does have the possibility of taking Nevada. If Trump can take Nevada and hold uh, hold Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, he wins. Um, but uh, you know, last night it looked like you know with Trump with pretty good leads in both Michigan and Wisconsin, it looked like he was on track for it. If he can win those, uh, he's got it. But uh, you know, Biden has taken the lead there. But Nevada has come back into play. It looked like Biden was going to run away with Nevada for a bit. Uh, but now it's it's much closer, and Nevada, uh, the whole election could swing on uh, on Nevada for uh, somehow. Um, Corey, how do you, you know? Last night, uh, Donald Trump uh, claimed victory. He said that there's a big fraud being perpetrated um, uh, against him and his supporters. Joe Biden did not concede defeat. Uh, I thought Joe Biden was reasonable not to concede defeat, even though it looked like he was going down. Uh, there was still enough out there that he ha still had a potential path to victory. So uh, how do you think the two candidates handled last night? Uh, do you think Biden should have been more strident one way or another about defeat or victory? And do you think that uh, Donald Trump was um, perhaps being too presumptuous in declaring victory and casting aspersions on the legitimacy of the election? Yeah, well, I, I think Biden came out and did it right. Of course, it was probably getting near his bedtime, so he couldn't talk for too long. But, I mean, he, he kept it brief and got to the point. He's saying, we're not out. Uh, we feel that there's, you know, there's a, that we're on the path to winning, but he didn't declare an outright victory, and he, he certainly didn't try to, to stir folks up. And, and it was unfortunate, but, but not unexpected out of uh, President Trump to uh, – I guess not just strongly declare, uh, virtually declare a victory, but also to uh, uh, cast dispersions on on the entire process. And and I just, I don't personally, and we'll see as, as evidence comes out, think there's any grand conspiracy or ballot stuffing, or at least not on a level that's going to make a difference on this election. Uh, it was a strategy. It was a mechanism to vote, and it definitely is dominating uh votes for the Democrats at this point. But now that he, Trump has thrown that doubt in um, and in a close race, again, I just fear for stability. I mean, the the 
the upset people, the conspiracy theorists, the others are, are never going to accept results no matter how they go at this point. And it, it's just bad for the entire process. And it's it's bad for the unity of that country going ahead. So I, I do wish perhaps he'd have restrained a, a bit on that and leave it to his lawyers perhaps to pursue it rather than in his speech last night. But uh, it's President Trump. What else do you expect? Yeah, uh, all the uh, major cities with their... Uh businesses all boarded up they're gonna have those poor businesses are probably gonna have to leave the boards up for some time more um if folks start rioting uh they don't know if they're gonna riot yet if they lose or not so um uh, the united states is entering a very dangerous time right now <clears throat> because both candidates could uh claim victory by uh casting aspersions on the vote they can you know biden might say uh Trump supporters are trying to stop our people, or Trump is trying to stop our votes from being counted. Trump could claim that uh, there's been funny business with all these mail-in ballots uh, in Pennsylvania. We have, uh, maybe Dave, you want to update us in Pennsylvania, all important Pennsylvania right now, these so-called naked ballots. Tell us what's happening there. Pennsylvania is still stuck at uh, 64%. Uh, Derek, no change in the numbers uh, uh, well, but tell us about the naked, the so-called naked ballots and the controversy with that. Uh, apparently, they're predicting um, court challenges over the so-called naked ballots. And what those are, Derek, are votes that have been mailed in, but not in their super secret pouch uh, or envelope. All votes obviously should be kept uh, uh, kept secret, but. A lot of these votes are being uh, sent in with uh, with them not in in the uh, the proper envelopes. So uh, everybody's talking about uh, lawsuits in that one. And interestingly, the Trump campaign has now tweeted six times since midnight asking for money for uh, for their legal fees as well. So I'm just interested in uh, is this uh, is this going to end today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year? I don't think uh, anybody can say at the moment. Well, in the event that this gets really tied up in the courts and uh, and the courts aren't able to resolve this by Inauguration Day in January, um, Nancy Pelosi would become the acting president of the United States. Uh, Donald Trump would cease to be president until it's resolved in the courts and someone can be sworn in. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how quickly the courts can react to this. This is... Not this is not like 2000, but just Florida. Everything hinged on Florida. Uh, you're going to probably see very serious legal challenges in Nevada, in uh, Pennsylvania, possibly in Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina, Georgia. Um, this is going to be quite a few court battles that'll be solved at the first dealt with at the state level, then probably make their way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And. Um, <sighs> The courts will have to work overtime. I mean, it would be an absolute disaster for the fabric of America's uh, political stability to not have, for the first time in their history, a president sworn in by Inauguration Day. So the courts are going to have to work overtime if they're going to have any chance of, of, of solving that and having a declared winner by then. And Derek, we all know what happened recently in the Supreme Court. So if it gets to that level, you're looking at a... Uh, uh, a definite Republican edge to uh, whatever vote comes out. That's with the uh, the swearing in of uh, Justice uh, uh, Barrett uh, just uh, last week, I believe it was. So they obviously did the right thing in getting their nominee uh, appointed before election date, uh, uh, if you're a Republican uh, fan. And it remains to be seen, though, uh, it is certainly a conservative uh, Supreme Court. It leans conservative on issues of judicial philosophy and ideology. Um, but is it uh, a Republican Supreme Court? That's that's a bigger question. Is um, is the Supreme Court going to side with Republicans just because they're appointed by Republicans, uh, or or not? Uh, there is a there is a difference between conservative judicial philosophy and just backing your guy because you want him to win. And uh, uh, pundits are saying, sorry, Derek. Pundits are saying that even if. Uh, the Chief Justice John Roberts votes on the side of the Democrats. There's still enough conservative-leaning uh, judges that they should still win the day. 
Yeah, although the Republicans would have to have at least some semblance of a case for that uh, for that to happen. Uh, they're not going to rule uh, based on nothing. I mean, they're as loaded as the U.S. Supreme Court is ideologically, one direction or another, uh, it it does still have to operate on the rule of law. The justices are likely to side one way or another, depending on what they like. But uh, it's going to still have to be based on something. They're not going to they're not going to pull it out of thin air. Um, okay, well, let's uh, let's turn closer. Is there anything else on the U.S. election, guys? I'd just like to speak a bit to the broader issues of some of the stuff that was learned last night, though. Uh, as we said right now, the only one who could clearly be declared a winner are, are lawyers, and, and they're uh, all going to be uh, an army of them doing just fine for the next few weeks. But those broader issues, the biggest losers were pollsters. Again, I mean, they were predicting for weeks uh, a Biden landslide. They were saying this was going to be knocked out of the park, and they were clearly found to be utterly wrong. Uh, the mainstream media and who were, you know, basically tied at the hip to a lot of those pollsters and silver and the rest, uh, again, have a lot of egg in their faces. Uh, and and their, their bias throughout this whole campaign was, was quite well exposed. Uh, I, I watched uh, last night on Fox and uh, uh, Tucker just tore a strip out of the mainstream media in general, including his own newsroom. And uh, it was it was just something quite interesting to watch. But there, there's going to be some broader fallout and, and changes to things in general uh, out of this election, aside from just the presidency itself. I mean, this entire campaign uh, set a, a whole different tone. That, and I don't think it was a good one, but hopefully uh, we've learned some things from it. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, the pollsters, as usual, were radically wrong when it comes to predicting Trump. Uh, we discussed this yesterday. I've actually got a bit of sympathy for them. Uh, I know it's not a popular thing to say, but it's very hard to measure Trump's support because uh, a lot of Trump supporters don't say they support Trump in the polls. The polls are, are, are pretty good most of the time in scientifically weighting uh, demographics and regions, you know, balancing men and women, ages, depending on how they think people are going to, what numbers people are going to come out to vote urban and rural and, and their locations. Um, but it's hard to adjust for shy voters, people who intend to vote Trump when they get into the ballot box, but won't tell the pollster that up front. So that's that's why in general, uh, when I look at these polls, I take the polls uh, at face value, and then I generally add 3% for Trump as a rule of thumb. Add 3% for him on top of what the polls are saying. The polls aren't completely wrong, but they do underplay Trump's support because it's so hard to measure. And, I, and that what we saw last night is he generally outperforms by about 3 or 4%, depending on, on where it is. And that's that was enough to move this from the blowout that uh, the pollsters and a lot of the major networks in the United States were predicting to what we saw, which is a nail-biter election that is almost certainly going to be decided in the courts, not at the ballot box. Well, let's, um, let's bring things closer to home now. Um, in case anyone's paying attention, uh, Monday there was uh, quite a blow up in the legislature. The NDP brought forward a motion uh, trying to get the UCP on the record about uh, independence for Alberta, try to essentially play a little bit of games, uh, sticking a knife in the divisions of the Tory caucus between the Federalists, which dominate the party, and uh, potential sovereignists, which uh, are... Uh, now, not much of a secret kind of uh, within its ranks. Some of them hiding, some of them not hiding. Dave, uh, why don't you give us an update about what happened? Yeah, and we've got some breaking news uh, on that front uh, too, Derek. The NDP motion uh, was put in, uh, as you say, to uh, to uh, debate independence. The uh, UCP uh, stood up and said, uh, that's not fair. Uh, it breaks the relationship between a... Uh, uh, M, or an MLA and and his uh, constituent, so that was basically put to the uh, bottom of the order papers, meaning it's never going to see the uh, uh, the light of day probably. But uh, in a story I just published on WesternStandardOnline.com, Rebel UCP MLA Drew Barnes has again broken ranks, and he has stood up and said, uh, "Hang on a second, fellows, this is completely unfair to the NDP party." Uh, he says private members' bills are one of the few things that uh, MLAs have a chance to do uh, themselves that, that aren't linked to the party. He said in his time in the legislature, he's only been able to, to do it twice and only being able to stand up and speak for his uh, Cypress Medicine Hat constituents twice in all those years. So 
you know, Barnes keeps uh, poking the bear. Um, he's disagreed with the government on many, many issues, including uh, EMS uh, dispatch consolidation. He wrote a uh, another report on the fair, de fair uh, deal panel saying that independence needs to be on the table if Alberta's uh, got any chance of... Uh, of making a better deal in confederation. But uh, yeah, Barnes is uh, poking the, the uh, wasp's nest once again. Yeah, this this is, uh, we're, we're just seeing this come across the wire now from uh, the story you broke, Dave. Uh, really, while, while we're discussing this here, you're, you're a talented man doing stories while you're on the air. Um, but uh, I, Drew Barnes uh, really poking the bear, as you said. Um, he is now... So, so kind of a bit of background, um, there is something called private members business in the Alberta legislature. There's private members motions and bills. They're drawn by a lottery. And they're really kind of the only opportunity the vast majorities of MLAs have to have any kind of impact on the agenda of the legislature. If you're not a part of the cabinet, you don't get to propose bills unless you get one of these rare private members motions or bills. And uh, Drew Barnes spent two terms in opposition. Uh, you know, I, I spent one term in opposition. I never, uh, actually, I did get lucky to draw a private member's motion once. That was to cut MLA pay. And I, unfortunately, I was the only member to vote for it. Everyone, uh, the NDP and the Tories voted, they voted against it at the time. But it was an opportunity for me to put something on the agenda. Uh, Drew Barnes, having been in opposition, gets that it's very important that this is not messed with. Uh, the governing side can vote against private members' motions and bills. But it was an unprecedented step for them to outright cancel debate on it, to not allow a vote on it. Um, uh, Corey, let's go to you. Uh, why do you think the Tories took an unprecedented step of essentially canceling private members' business, uh, killing this motion without any debate or a vote? Um, and, and then secondly, uh, why do you think Barnes uh, did this and, and very publicly broke ranks with his party in the legislature? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a, a brilliant political play on the part of the NDP. If, you know, not even necessarily for the sake of Albertans, but just on a political partisan brinkmanship, you know that there's a lot of unrest within the UCP caucus because there is a growing uh, number of supporters for, for an independence option, at least flirting with it, if not outright, and they just don't want to touch it. And doing this forces it right onto the floor. There was no choice. You guys are going to have to talk about this. And, of course, that could potentially uh, bring about a great deal more rifts within the party. It would force them to stand and be counted. Do you consider this a viable option or not? And for every MLA, because we've seen that, uh, you know, Notley's pretending to be supportive of Barnes who's taking his stand, but Notley was demanding that he be thrown out before because he's taken independent style stands. And if this motion had gone to the floor and five or six uh, UCP members had, had voted uh, saying that they, they, they don't support that motion, then Notley could say, well, look, we've got this nest of separatists in there. Kenny, what are you doing? Are you a separatist party? I mean, they could just make so much hay out of it. Uh, Drew Barnes, I guess you'd have to ask him what he's up to. He's, he's, uh, not walking to the beat of the, the premier's drum. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, there's been some speculation that maybe he's kind of looking to get kicked out and, and, and uh, take over in, in uh, representing that segment of the population uh, in, in an independence type movement. Though, I mean, perhaps Drew's just also using his role as an MLA because he wants to speak to that uh, thing. Perhaps we can get him on again soon to uh, talk about that. I think that's something we should absolutely do. Uh, Get, but we should get him on the get him on the broadcast here, uh, and hear from him directly. Um, I can tell you that it is extremely rare for uh, MLAs to uh, to vote against the party line, let alone do it uh, on a semi regular basis. Uh, I did it as a Wild Rose MLA, uh, and it was not uh, the smartest career move one can take to to oppose your party whip, uh, particularly doing it on a on a semi regular basis. Uh, Drew Barnes is doing it pretty regularly here, speaking out uh, on, on this. Uh, I think he, it certainly looks like he's daring them to take him on. Uh, I think there's Tory leadership is smart enough to know where the polls are at and that kicking him out would look pretty bad uh, for keeping their coalition together. And they, even though the, the Tories are federalists, they do rely on, uh, according to the polling we had done, half of their support, 52% uh, of uh, UCP voters 
back independents. And those are the ones who haven't already left for one of the independence parties. So uh, kicking them out would be extremely dangerous. But at some point, uh, you know, the question is, is uh, Jason Kenney going to decide that it's better to keep them inside the tent pissing out or, or outside the tent uh, pissing in? And that's, uh, that, that's going to be a pretty big decision for them to make. But if they do kick them out, uh, are they going to end up martyring them politically and, uh, and giving more air to uh, moving the independence movement outside of the Tory tent uh, in, into uh, something like the Wild Rose Independence Party? Uh, gentlemen, if you can uh, talk amongst yourselves for a minute, I'm just in contact with Drew Barnes right now, and I'll see if I can't get him on the show with us right now. Oh, very good. Well, be, be sure to send uh, Drew a link and uh, and uh, just give him give him a quick instructions about how to get on. Uh, we we'd love to have Drew on right now, um, or uh, or we could. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's let let's see uh, see if you can get him on. Uh, Drew, do you think uh, Jason Kenny is going to put up with um, with uh, Drew Barnes marching to his own beat like this for much longer? Yeah, it, it's hard to say how much more he can take because, of course, that emboldens more potential unrest or, or revolution within caucus. Uh, he's really a, between a rock and a hard place with this whole thing. Uh, even with this motion being buried, uh, you know, they used a political... Uh, a mechanism to bury a political mechanism, but I think it had the effect Notley wanted anyways. It's just not in the same way. She wanted to cause some strife and division within that caucus. Uh, she wanted to be able to paint that party as being uh, potentially separatist, and uh, that speculation is going now, uh, whether the motion came to the floor or not. Perhaps, in hindsight, it would have been healthier for the uh, motion to have hit the floor and, and uh, they can just at least uh, speak for themselves one by one as to whether they're supportive or not of those sorts of things. So it's made quite a mess for Jason Kenney and uh, Drew's uh, carrying on with that mess right now. Yeah. Um, it's uh, Drew is really, uh, he is the only one of the original class of 2012 wild rosers to still be in the wild rose caucus, uh, sorry, in the UCP caucus. Uh, the vast majority of, uh, the other two um, who were left over, who were real, who survived the floor crossing and uh, came back as Wild Rosers in 2015, uh, when I was elected as a Wild Rose MLA, uh, one of them was kind of pushed into retirement. That's uh, Pat Steer, and the other one, Rick Strankman, uh, was taken out in a in a hostile nomination. Uh, and people have a lot of theories about what happened there. Um, uh, and then of the other uh, Wild Rosers in 2015 who were elected, um, some of them were uh, were real Wild Rosers, uh, not too, but uh, it was kind of mixed. But among the strong personalities of the Wild Rosers, uh, there's not a lot who were um, who are who are really left standing. Drew Barnes really is kind of uh, among the very last of the old Wild Rose school to still be in the Alberta legislature right now. And uh, the Wild Rose culture is very different than the old PC culture. And, you know, a, a lot of folks, uh, myself included, think that that, uh, that the UCP culture more reflects uh, the PC culture or the Conservative Party of Canada's culture than it does the old uh, re uh, Reform Party or uh, Wild Rose culture. So uh, that, that'll be uh, fascinating to see, um, you know, is Drew Barnes able to to mesh that uh, Wild Rose chip on his shoulder that he carries with the way they're doing things right now? Uh, I do think we're about to get Drew Barnes uh, here. Uh, let's go to Dave uh, as we see if we can plug uh, Drew Barnes in. Hey, uh, Drew's uh, going to be here in a, in a second or two. I think he just wants to go audio at the moment, uh, probably up late last night like all of us and Maybe has a case of uh, bed hair going or something like that. But, uh, yeah, he'll be on uh, within moments, and uh, we'll get to hear from the horse's mouth exactly what his uh, strategy is moving forward. Uh, Drew Barnes, do we have you live right now? Yes, you do. Hello, Derek. Hello, Dave. Oh, very good. Okay, well, we've got uh, Drew Barnes live on the line. No video, but we've got Drew's, uh, Drew's audio. Uh, Drew, thanks for joining us. Uh, why don't you start... Tell us, uh, well, what the heck is happening right now? <laughs> well, it's it's an interesting time for sure. Um, you know, yesterday was 
you know, another example of, of what, uh, you know, I've been fighting for for almost nine years, what I've been talking about. And, uh, you know, Derek, I, I just did hear your preliminary words a minute or two ago, and, and you're bang on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to have represented Cypress Medicine Hat since 2012, starting the first two times as, as a wild roser. And so much of what the wild rose was trying to do in 10, uh, 2011, 2012 was democratic reform. Uh, grassroots involvement, more more opportunity for MLAs to talk in the legislature, more opportunity for Albertans to, to have uh, direct access with citizen-initiated reforms, uh, answers to questions, input into to the Alberta economy and Alberta bureaucracy and rules. And, uh, you know, so so basically yesterday was a time when uh, through, through uh, a standing order... Uh, technique uh through a government motion that was was adjourned uh you know we we get so little members private members time now only three hours a, a week and that's provided we sit on a monday and for some reason we haven't been sitting a lot of mondays uh so uh i i just felt it was absolutely wrong you know to the to the 62 or 63 of us that aren't in cabinet that uh that three hours a week is uh sacrosanct and uh, you know, too important and too too limited in his time to uh, to take away. So I was grateful that uh, you know I'm glad that uh, you know uh, member Heather Sweet from the NDP put in a point of privilege. I was pleased to stand up and support her on that. And uh, I believe the speaker is going to be ruling. I hope today about one thirty, maybe maybe just before uh, orders at, at three o'clock. But uh, I'll, I'll be interested in hearing what he has to say. Uh, Drew, uh, do we, um, has there been any reaction from your caucus colleagues or the leadership of the party to you, uh, breaking ranks on this to, uh, essentially try to maintain the integrity of the private members business process? Has there, has there been any, um, has there been any, uh, any word from the leadership or your caucus colleagues yet? No, there, there, there's, there's been nothing. Uh, no, you know, nobody from the WIPS office or, or from uh, Premier Kenny's office has reached out to me. Uh, but I've had several, oh. several of my UCP uh, colleagues, uh, uh, some of my, you know, you know, what needed you needed to be said. Uh, a lot of said, thank you for saying it, you know, with, with passion and with meaning. And, uh, you know, I, you know, basically, I, you know, talked about the fact that uh, we get so little opportunities to do this in nine years, Derek and Dave. Uh, I've only had two off. Sorry, Drew, uh, your audio's cut out a little bit. Drew? All right, well, we're having a little trouble with, uh, with Drew's audio. Um, Drew, when you get your audio working, uh, please pipe back up. We uh, we want to hear from you, um, Corey. Uh, how do you think this is going to go down in the premier's office? <laughs> well, I, I suspect he's not thrilled. I mean, this was something they kind of hoped to bury and have it forgotten. Uh, it's a busy news week, you know, outside of the country, and of course with with COVID and everything else going on, uh, this was just something I don't think that Premier Kenny wanted to deal with. Uh, Drew's making it clear that that he speaks for his constituency and uh, the uh, uh, more you know grassroots, old school, wild rose sort of thing, and and he's not going to back down on these things. So uh, the, the line keeps getting drawn in the sand. Uh, we'll see. I mean, if, if nothing gets done from Premier Kenny's office this week, uh, we'll see where Drew goes next week. Uh, fascinating, uh, Drew. Oh. Looks like we've lost Drew. Um, uh, well, ho hopefully we'll get him back. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, just, to, just to follow up what Corey was talking about, Premier Kenny had hoped this was going to be a one-day news cycle event, uh, come up Monday afternoon and then be buried and forgotten uh, for good. What uh, Drew Barnes's move has done is made it a continuing story now that has now turned into a three- or four-day story uh, which increases the embarrassment uh, to uh, Premier Kenny's office. So uh, the Premier will be less than pleased. And I think, Derek, as you mentioned, it's just, you know, how many times is 
the Premier's office going to allow uh, Drew Barnes to be a renegade uh, before they finally say, OK, enough's enough. Go uh, go sit by yourself in the corner. Well, I've, I've sat in that corner before. And, uh, it, it can be a lonely corner, but uh, it's a rewarding corner because you, you get to do a lot more than you do uh, just uh, sitting and following orders. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how much longer that will go. Uh, I think, uh, Corey, you were, you were bang on that, um, you know, shutting down the private members business of the day, which has never been done as far as I know in the history of Alberta. I'm not even sure it's ever been done in any province or federally, just shutting down private members business like that. It just doesn't happen. Um, but uh, it, it, it was an extraordinary move. And... Um, there's going to be some political fallout. I think we do have Drew Barnes back. Uh, I'll put it to uh, you, Dave, and uh, Corey for uh, questions you've got for Drew. Hey, Drew. Uh, yeah. We've just been talking about uh, uh, Premier Kenny and uh, uh, you repeatedly poking uh, the stick. Is your what's your end game? Do you have an end game, or are you just going issue by issue? Well. You know, an end game. My end game has always been the same. I'm grateful to represent Cypress Medicine Hat. Oh, Drew, I think you're covering up your microphone a bit. Oh, okay. Sorry. How's that? That's better. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, my end game's always been the same. Uh, for more hope, more opportunity for Alberta families and Alberta communities. Of course, particularly Cypress Medicine Hat, which I'm I'm fortunate to to represent. Um, there's a quite a difference of opinion right now about what we should do about our relationship with Ottawa and our Canadian partners. Uh, the NDP motion, of course, was under no conditions should we ever question our, our loyalty to, to Ottawa. And we're always going to be better off as, as part of Canada. Uh, of course, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, then when the government shut down the debate on that motion, and their motion was more like, we're, uh, we believe in the United, uh, being a United uh, Canada and part of Canada, but we will work towards a fair deal. And, and as I've consistently put out, there has to be consequences. Uh, not only should we immediately start to move towards the, the items in the famous firewall letter from 20 years ago, that, that you know, now consecutive fair deal panels have talked about from collecting our own taxes, from having our own pension, uh, from our own police force, our own chief firearms officer, control of immigration, but we there also has to be consequences. Uh, Albertans need to to have the opportunity to to let Ottawa know, you know, in a year or two or or whatever, if Ottawa hasn't come to the table in a fair way, and, and the best consequences is a referendum on independence, and uh, I, I believe that in my heart, and I believe also strongly that. Uh, Albertans need the opportunity to get engaged, to be involved in discussion. Uh, one of the real joys of the Fair Deal panel was as, as tens and tens, hundreds of Albertans went to the mic, there were so many great, unique, new ideas uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I think, you know, that and development of our own Alberta written constitution would go so, so far to, to strengthen our culture and, and solidify Alberta being the free and most prosperous jurisdiction in the world. Those those are what I'm, I'm looking for. Uh, Drew, when the province announced that they were going to be studying the uh, provincial police idea and not report back until April, you immediately issued a statement saying, enough's enough, we need to get this done now, uh, let's do it now, we've got enough sheriffs, uh, let's move on it. Obviously, you're frustrated at the pace of... Uh, the UCP's actions when it comes to uh, trying to implement the fair deal. Yeah, yeah, David, it's not only me. Uh, Albertans everywhere are telling me, quit studying, just do it, particularly the things that we don't need Ottawa support or, or the other provinces support, like the constitutional items, whether we need seven provinces and 50% of uh, Canadian population. The things we can do, like give notice by March 31st to, to run our own police force, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of elements there. The values being a bit different out of Ottawa have, have, have made our legal system, you know, some, some issues here. You know, I, I can't count 
the number of times I hear about people being arrested five times and still not locked up, uh, and, and the, the impact that has on, on quality, quality police work. Um, Ottawa does subsidize our, our police about $100 million a year now, but all the signals are that they're going to discontinue doing that. There's been some unionization and cost increases in the RCMP. Uh, there's been cost increases everywhere. So Ottawa is clearly giving the signals that they're going to discontinue this anyway. So without even counting the leverage that we can start to gain with our, our Canadian partners by showing that we are you know, self-reliant, we can stand our, on our own, um, the, the, these things only only make sense. Um, I'll give you another example from from yesterday. Um, we have emergency helicopter response in the south called Halo. Uh, we've been waiting years to get the same amount of per capita support that Stars gets for the rest province. Uh, the health minister Andrew has been saying that he would have a HEMS review for helicopter emergency management system. Uh, it was supposed to be due in the summer. It was backed up to. Uh, backed up to September 30th, and I believe today at uh, RUMA announced that uh, the report wasn't conclusive enough, wasn't didn't cover that enough. So, you know, all that time, all that money, and the answer still wasn't wasn't there that, that we can tell you right now. And the same with the police force. Let's just do it. Well, um, Drew, uh, that's interesting stuff. Um, I'm interested to know, uh, you know, what do you think is, um, you know, the NDP are obviously trying to uh, get this debated. We know, we know they obviously are not particularly sympathetic. Just break it up, I can't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, uh, so I'm sorry, Jared, you know that. Probably... Sorry, what was that, Drew? I just no, it looks I, like I just we may have lost broke through. up a bit. Sorry. Okay, uh, Drew. Uh, we know the NDP are obviously not sympathetic to the independence cause, but they did want this debated in the legislature. I think they're trying to uh, get others on the record. It's been well known where you stand. Um, are there others in the UCP caucus who uh, think as you do that uh, that independence needs to be on the table, or are you uh, more or less on your own on this? Okay, well, well, thank you. You know, I, I guess I'll let my colleagues speak for themselves, but I will say this, you know, many, many of them reached out to me, inquired about, you know, more precisely what I heard Fair Deal panel. And, and let's be clear, 80% of Albertans that went to the mic said our relationship with Ottawa is broken. We need change. Uh, the degree and the amount of change that they oh, wanted sorry, did sorry, Drew. somewhat. Sorry, Drew. Drew, I was referring to within the UCP caucus. Uh, you, you've been pretty outspoken on this, but uh, are there others within the UCP caucus who believe independence should be on the table, or are you the only non-federalist? Um, again, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, I think that this is discussion going forward. The next three months is very, very interesting. I will let them speak for themselves. Very good. Uh, let's put it to you, Corey, for any questions you've got. Uh, while we're getting near the end, I, I just want to throw one out quickly. Drew, have you, have you been talking to the Wilders Independence Party at all? Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely have. I mean, I, you know, I've really enjoyed politics. And, and Corey, I, you know, including your and my friendship now for 10 or 12 years, uh, I've talked to 10 or 12 Albertans absolutely every day. And uh, I, a lot of them call me. Uh, a lot of them discuss... Uh, you know, their thoughts and their ideas. Uh, I am so grateful that uh, people like the Wild Rose Independence Party, uh, you know, the old uh, legacy parties of Wexit and Freedom Conservative come together. They, they care deeply about Albertans, our families. They care deeply about hope and opportunity and, and helping each other. So so I'm so glad they're there. And uh, we, uh, let's, let's, let's see what happens going forward. I, I you know, all voices are important. Um, well, uh, Drew, uh, what do you think is next here? Um, so we're, we're obviously going to still wait on the, uh, speaker to make a ruling on this remains to be seen how it's going to work. Uh, 
I, I think parliamentary precedent has it that uh, this is highly inappropriate for the government to use its majority to effectively cancel private members' business, not allow any debate, not allow any vote on things uh, not determined in advance by the government. Um, uh, so I will ask you about next steps forward, but uh, I was quite shocked when I was watching the, I don't really watch a lot of the legislature much anymore, but uh, I was quite shocked when they did that. Uh, was there any notice given to the UCP caucus that this debate would be uh, would be ended the way it was, or uh, did this just kind of get sprung on everybody out of nowhere? Hey, Derek, Derek, you're just a little bit hard to hear, so I, I think you you know what was a surprise. Yeah, sorry. My question I'm was uh, I'm surprised. I had no idea. Sorry, Drew. Um, we didn't hear you. Uh, my question was, did uh, the, mo the move by the Tory majority to uh, cancel private members' business, um, you know, without any debate or vote, was, was notice given to the UCP caucus that this would happen? Uh, or was this just kind of done uh, and you found out while it was happening in the legislature? Yeah, sorry, sorry Derek. I can just only hear every fourth or fifth word. But I was totally surprised. I believe in action. They had no idea the five minutes time was circumvented. Um, you know, when the government tried to bring Bill 304, the private member's bill uh, that we were on, the NDP didn't allow it. Uh, I think because, you know, they felt it, they felt that they'd been slighted. Um, you know, maybe they should have, but, but, you know, that would have been a huge, uh, a huge, you know, reaction to not, uh, to not, be upset as to what happened so uh but you know it's it's you know one of the things that we need to look at and it's back to you know when we started in this wild movement started in 2000 and you know last the late life is and the, you know the john murdochs and the paul hinman's and you know these people the danielle smith's Corey morgan all the people that had worked so hard before we really wanted and we were really hearing from Albertans a deep desire for more grassroots involvement in our democratic process. Um, hopefully what happened yesterday is one of those catalysts, one of those steps along where a government that cares, a government that listens, will enhance and things will only get better. That's my hope. Uh, well, this kind of brings it back uh to what we were saying when you joined us in this conversation originally um, about, you know, what kind of culture is prevail, uh, prevailing within the UCP. Um, you know, we, we both uh, served together in the Wild Rose Caucus and that had a particular, uh, a particular culture. It was never popular within the Wild Rose Caucus amongst the leadership for any of us to break ranks uh, and, and vote against the party whip. Um, but we, we certainly did from time to time. Um, and then, you know, we contrast that with the more PC culture or the Conservative Party of Canada culture, which is significantly more centralized. Um, which, do you, do you think the Wild Rose culture has got enough strength right now, or is uh, more of the older PC culture uh, pervading in terms of the role of an MLA and, uh, and that kind of uh, question around centralization or decentralization of the ability of MLAs to, uh, to do their own thing within the legislature? Sorry, Drew, do we have you? Derek, I think uh, I think Drew's audio was uh, was on its last legs there. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Drew. I mean, he literally literally joined us on five seconds notice. I just sent him a message and uh, he jumped right on with us to uh, let Western Standard viewers uh, hear his, uh, his stand. So, uh, uh, just to let uh, viewers know, I'll be keeping on top of the story all afternoon, and uh, I'm sure Drew and I will be talking as the the day goes uh, the day goes along. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, Drew, uh, we'd love to have you on for longer, but it looks like uh, the connection at your end is just a bit uh, not quite strong enough. Uh, please talk to tell us or whoever is uh, responsible for this. We'd we'd love to have you on again if we can get the stream working a little bit better. Uh, it's looking a bit like uh, something coming from Pritis right now. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, I, I think we're, uh, I think, well, that, that was fascinating. Uh, thanks uh, again to Drew Barnes for coming on and Dave for uh, bringing him on at uh, such late notice. Uh, but it made for a very interesting discussion. Um, I, mean, I want to thank everyone uh, of uh, our viewers for watching today. If you're not currently a member of the Western Standard, please go to westernstandardonline.com and go to membership. Uh, the Western Center does not uh, accept a penny of government funding. We don't comply with government media licensing and regulation. Uh, if you support a genuinely free press that is here for the West and just the West, uh, it's important that you're supporting independent journalism like the Western Standard. So uh, if you're not yet a member, please consider becoming one. And uh, those of you watching who are members, we thank you very much for your support um, for, for what we're doing. Uh, but uh, I'd like... Thank you, uh, Dave Naylor, for joining us today, news editor of the Western Standard, Corey Morgan, podcast editor and columnist for the Western Standard. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, everyone, today. God bless.